morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the panel on um, the Routledge Handbook for uh, Contemporary Central Asia. I am one of the editors of the handbook and we have four contributors joining us today. And we're gonna start, we'll start our discussion uh, with uh, Rico Isaacs uh, kicking off our discussion today. And then I'll say a few words and then We'll have the contributors uh, speak, uh, discuss their chapters, and then we'll open up to the audience for any questions, comments, reflections. So Rico, why don't you take it from here? Thanks, Erica, and thank you everyone for joining us um, from wherever you are in the world. Um, it's great to have so many people here. I'm very happy today to be essentially launching, well, Erica and I are launching this handbook, the Routledge Handbook of Contemporary Central Asia, uh, contemporary Central Asia, uh, that arguably it's been, I think, uh, roughly about three years in the making from conception to actually publication. Uh, when I and when I reflect back on this, I think that's actually pretty good going for um, we've got over 30 contributions in the volume. Uh, over, you know, half that time was during the pandemic. So I think it's a, a testament actually to in, in particular the work of the contributors in, in to getting stuff in, 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 in a timely manner. So yeah, it's, a, it's, it's great to be able to launch the book officially today. Um, I just wanted to say a very few words about it, just to give you a general sense, and then I'll pass over to Erica. I mean, really the, the idea of a handbook emerged out of this sense that, of, that in, in, out of this sense that Central Asian studies as a discipline has been growing exponentially uh, certainly in the last two decades, even if the last three decades, really, since the collapse of the Soviet Union. But there have been yet there had there yet to be a volume, a single volume that had sought to kind of reflect the developments of the field, uh, a comprehensive volume that sought to reflect those developments in the field. And arguably, this is what we have tried to do with this handbook is to to offer um, and the contributions within it, an authoritative survey of the development of scholarship. Um, emanating from the region and about the region uh, across a number of different disciplines from politics, history, international relations, uh, political geography, uh, society and culture and religion. Um, and so that's really the aim or was the aim of the volume. The other, I think, distinct aim was to try and involve as many scholars from the region as possible in it we uh, both Erica and I thought that this was important especially now you know 30 years after the collapse of the Soviet Union if you're going to have a handbook on Central Asia you know Central Asian scholarship or, sorry Central Asian scholars and the voices of Central Asia the Central Asians themselves need to be um, obviously reflected in that book properly um, I think on reflection it would have been nice if we could go on further with that but as ever with these types of very large projects, you know, people drop out, they have other commitments, um, but nonetheless, I think it is a start. And of course, there's more work to do. So that's all I really want to say. And um, I want to thank the, the, our contributors in particular who have come to join us today. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what they uh, are going to tell us. Erica. Yes, thank you. So the project was um, first created by Rico and he invited me later uh, and I was ex really excited to, to join because of the, some of the distinct features of this handbook. So one of the um, features, I think, one of the um, really important uh, uh, you know, highlights uh, of this book is that we're not focusing on specific uh, countries. So we don't say, you know, here's a chapter on Kazakhstan, here's a chapter on Uzbekistan. And that's what tends to happen uh, in area studies uh, handbooks, but um, it was more focused on uh, major issues, um, starting from history to politics, um, economics, uh, social issues, uh, religion, um, international relations, and so on. So each chapter covers a uh, broad topic, um, and uh, whoever covers uh, the chapter is really um, an expert on uh, that's, uh, that topic. Um, so today we have speakers like uh, Johan Engvall, who uh, studied corruption uh, in Kyrgyzstan and beyond, and who is really an expert both on Kyrgyzstan and on corruption, on corruption patterns. Um, around the world uh, in post-Soviet uh, in post-Soviet um, uh, context, but also around the world. Um, then we have um, um, authors like uh, Nargis Kasyanova, um, who is an expert on uh, 
many things, but including uh, China's influence in Central Asia and at the same time on uh, Kazakhstan's in Central Asian foreign policy. So she covered uh, a chapter on uh, Chinese um, foreign policy in Central Asia. So that's one highlight. Another highlight I want to say is that even though um, contributors were asked to essentially um, summarize their research uh, in their chapters, in their respective chapters, uh, they really experimented with new approaches as well. Uh, so Marlene Darwell, uh, who covered um, Russian influence in Central Asia or Russian relations with Central Asia, she incorporated uh, this uh, new angle, new perspective into uh, the topic on the rise of post-colonial uh, perspectives in Central Asia. So that was an innovative way of um, discussing this topic, the relations with China uh, between Russia and Central Asian countries. Then we have uh, contributors like Emil Magabayev, who took a completely different approach. Uh, he didn't really um, discuss uh, any theoretical implications of his topic, and his topic is on urban spaces in, uh, in Kyrgyzstan, but his approach was more narrative-based, more um, ethnographic on the developments of um, um, so, uh, in civil society fighting, fighting for uh, a greener space, greener city in, uh, um, in Bishkek, greener spaces in Bishkek. Um, so it's really narrative-based chapter, which was, again, um, uh, different from what we usually read um, about um, on, on Central Asia. Um, and then finally, um, also on inclusion and representation, uh, we did our best, absolute best, to include as many uh, diverse voices into the volume. And I think we succeeded more than other volumes, but there is a lot of work to be done in the future as well. And one of the issues I think uh, future um, handbooks like this uh, need to do is to really invite as many uh, uh, Central Asian scholars as possible because Central Asians, it, it's Central Asian scholars, um, they're facing more challenges in um, producing written work compared to their Western counterparts. And we need to uh, make sure that we give enough time, enough resources um, early on so that we actually have voices from Central Asia represented in our joint work. Um, and I think, so my final word is, I think this volume, it will be useful for um, anyone who wants to learn about Central Asia, be that uh, from a policy perspective, from, from developmental or development, development organization perspective uh, um, in Europe, United States and Russia, but it's also a very useful, um, useful instrument for anyone teaching Central Asia um, because each chapter sort of um, summarizes a, t a topic, be that on authoritarianism, on history, on military history um, in Central Asia. Um, and it brings everything together within one concise chapter. And then you can add, when you teach Central Asia, you can add more specific case studies um, in, uh, in, in, um, in addition to a uh, handbook. I think this is a very useful um, tool for teaching. So with that, let's turn to our speakers and I want to briefly introduce them. Uh, first, we have Dina Sharipova. She is uh, an assistant professor of political science in the Graduate School of Public Policy in Nur Sultan. Um, and her research uh, focuses on issues of identity, identity politics and policies in Central Asia, security issues. Um, and she will talk about more political aspects, her chapter um, uh, dealing with uh, political um, uh, political regimes and po politics in Central Asia. Then we have um, Dr. Uh, Johan Engvall. He is a researcher at the Swedish Defense Research Agency. Um, he is also a non-resident senior fellow at the Central Asia Caucasus and Institute and Social Growth Studies Program. And his chapter uh, covers uh, corruption patterns in uh, Central Asia. Um, then we have uh, Galim Jusudbek. Um, he is an independent researcher based in Almaty. Um, and he's um, also a faculty member at the Department of Social Sciences and Suleiman uh, Demirel at, uh, at Dagi Uni University. Um, 
in uh, Kaskirin Almaty. Um, his chapter covers uh, religion and liberal liberalism in Central Asia. And finally, we have um, Edward Lemon. Ed Lemon. He is a research assistant professor at the Bush School of Government and Politics um, and Public Service, excuse me, and uh, at Texas A&M University. He is also a founder of the Oxus Society. Um, and he will discuss his chapter on uh, politics towards Islam in Central Asia. So in that order, we'll, uh, we pass the floor to our uh, contributors. Zina, the floor is yours. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Erika. Good, every, uh, good evening or good morning, everyone uh, from Nur Sultan. So in the first place, I would like to express my gratitude to Erika and Rico uh, for the opportunity to take part in this project. Uh, I believe that it was really a brilliant idea uh, to invite different scholars uh, to write on various topics related to Central Asia uh, and um, uh, the scholarship, Central Asian scholarship on, uh, was uh, in need of such volume. And I, I believe that it will be very insightful and interesting, not only for scholars, uh, faculty and students, but also um, you know, for a wider audience. So uh, I guess I will talk a little bit about uh, the chapter that Aziz Burhanov, my colleague and uh, myself uh, wrote, and then uh, just maybe outline some trends that are going on on um, the scholarship nation building. So the chapter that Aziz Burhanov uh, myself have written together was devoted to a building in Central Asia. And our goal was to provide an overview of national identity policies and uh, discourses related to nation building in five countries. Uh, I hope that uh, readers uh, will find this chapter very uh, insightful and uh, informative uh, since uh, we try to include um, the background information on each country because it's impo important to understand uh, national identity policies in those countries. Uh, so we identify the background and also uh, followed by the sections on uh, national policies and uh, discourses uh, in each country. So I will not go into detail uh, about uh, this chapter and especially you know, policies, uh, national identity policies uh, in each country, uh, since you will read uh, hopefully uh, this handbook. Uh, but briefly, we tried to um, show some similarities and differences of nation building projects across uh, Central Asian states. And uh, we also highlighted main uh, issues or main topics um, that are discussed in uh, public discourse. So I guess that uh, probably the peculiarity or specificity of our chapter was that we tried to, appro uh, to approach it from a comparative perspective. Although we observed that uh, the field on um, nation building uh, is growing and we see more and more works, but not many studies uh, have been done uh, from a comparative perspective. So uh, our chapter offers this opportunity to see uh, how different and how similar national identity policies are across uh, five Central Asian states. So uh, for instance, we showed uh, that uh, Central Asian countries, they uh, have uh, common commonalities in such um, areas as a revision of history, glorification of the past, uh, search for the uh, ancient prominent figures, uh, something that can unite contemporary societies. And uh, we also observe that many countries in Central Asia try to uh, celebrate the anniversaries uh, of uh, statehood, like it was in uh, Kazakhstan, the celebration of the Kazakh Khanat, or uh, the celebration of Tajik and uh, Kyrgyz statehood uh, in those countries uh, to promote a sense of unity and continuity with the past. Uh, in our chapter, we also showed uh, and identified and discussed uh, language policies, which are a very important part of nation building projects uh, in the region, uh, particularly in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. Of course, there is uh, some variation because uh, language policy might be very important for some countries rather than in others. And uh, this is based on the demographic factors, the contextual factors that we also highlighted in our chapters. Um, so, uh, uh, and also I would like to talk a little bit about uh, the uh, trends that we observe today uh, on the scholarship, in the scholarship on Central Asian um, politics and particularly uh, nation building. Uh, 
uh, in five countries. Uh, first of all, uh, we see a significant growth, right? A significant growth uh, in the number of works on nation building in Central Asia. And it is not only scholars who come from their uh, Western society, but lots of uh, local scholars also contribute uh, to the study of the subject. And uh, the topics that uh, scholars discuss vary from, uh, let's say, the, the revenge nationalism or inter-ethnic relations, language policies, to the role of elites in the construction of a nation, uh, um, importance of art, uh, cinematography, literature in uh, nation building in Central Asia. So uh, basically um, uh, we see that the scope of topics has expanded significantly during the last decade. So this is one trend. Another trend is that um, scholars now focus not only or use not only a top-down approach to investigate uh, nation building in uh, Central Asia, but also they focus on the, at the micro level and um, use the bottom-up approach. Uh, so we uh, hear more voices from the grassroots level, uh, which also, of, of course, help us to understand uh, how people perceive nation-building projects promoted by the government. So it's not only focused on um, governmental policies, the promotion of the um, national uh, identity policies by the elites uh, and authorities, but also how people from the um, grassroots level uh, perceive them, right? So this is also some kind of a new trend that we observe in the scholarship or nation building. Uh, another important uh, issue or maybe tool, uh, thing is that uh, scholars now use different tools and methods. Uh, so it's not only case studies, but uh, scholars also apply um, surveys. Uh, so um, lots of, uh, not, not a lot, but some studies also use uh, survey-based um, research. Uh, another important also trend, I would say that um, there is a more, there are more works on um, Central Asian um, national identity policies that uh, I approach from a comparative perspective. But this is also one of the uh, probably uh, missing areas because although we observe the uh, growth in the, uh, the comparative works, on the other hand, we don't have them enough, right? So for instance, the recent book by uh, Diana Kudarbir Genova, where she compares um, Kazakhstan with Latvia, so other works uh, that I approach from comparative perspectives, but it would be beneficial to see more works that compare not to three countries, but maybe all five states. And uh, another important uh, step forward uh, in the scholarship on nation building would be probably um, the um, theoretical consideration. So more works should focus on uh, conceptual issues and theoretical issues. It's also one of the things that are missing uh, in the scholarship on uh, nation building uh, in Central Asia. Uh, and uh, I guess probably the last one, the, the trend that uh, I can identify is that uh, today we also see some offers or suggestions to move away uh, from this dichotomous interpretation of um, national identity in Central Asia, not to focus on ethnic identity or, um, let's say, national identity, but uh, to approach um, this research from a uh, from different perspective uh, and uh, uh, maybe uh, use uh, like multi-level or uh, multi-lateral um, approaches uh, to uh, identify uh, the policies and uh, national identities in Central Asia. I guess um, in terms of discourses uh, that we also touched upon in our article, in our ch chapter is uh, that um, there should be more focus not only on the dominant discourse, but also on the discourses, uh, minority discourses. So what are other people, not titular nations, but also minority groups uh, talk about? And uh, I think that it will be also important uh, contribution to the study uh, of national identity in Central Asia. So this is briefly about our chapter. Thank you, Dina, so, so much. Um, and I want to correct myself. I said Emilna Gabayev, but Emilna Sridina, of course. But thank you, Dina. This is really helpful overview of your chapter and then the field in general. Thank you. So moving on to uh, Johan Engvall now. 
floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, th I can only agree with uh, Dina and express my gratitude to, to the editors for, for putting this valuable volume together and also for inviting me to take part in this. Um, yeah, my topic then, uh, corruption in, in Central Asia, I would say that that represents a story that is both of a general uh, and a specific nature, I would say. Uh, that this is a story of quite general nature it becomes quite clear just by looking at, for example, um, these international maps over corruption in the world produced by Transparency International, but there are also maps by different governance indexes and things like that. So if you look at the, that map, for instance, from in, uh, Transparency International, uh, you can see that most of the countries in the world, they are marked by uh, dark red or reddish color, yeah? which means that uh, the, in these countries, corruption is either highly widespread or rather widespread, if you can call it like that. So from, from this, the conclusion is then that the corruption is still the global norm in a way, not the exception as we are normally taught to believe. And also those countries that uh, are classified as having low levels of corrup corruption, uh, they also once used to be characterized by these type of practices uh, that we today uh, label corruption. So in a way, this is kind of the natural political order, I would say. Uh, but with that said, uh, of course, it's clear that corruption is per pervasive in, in Central Asia. And if you take the average of, of, of these five countries, um, the, if you say the typical Central Asian state usually rank in the bottom quarter. Yeah? Um, and it's also obvious that, that corruption in Central Asia has some quite distinct features. And here you can see that uh, scholarship uh, has documented that there were certain features of, of the Soviet system that provided some grounds for corruption. In particular, then that the, the planned economy and the ever-present state um, were critical in this. You know, accounting fraud of state production for the purpose of private pocketing. Uh, informal access to resources and goods, uh, and also a growing uh, shadow economy. Uh, these were practices uh, that you can say emerged as a response, is, as a response to, to um, peculiarities or, or failures of, of, of the command economy. Uh, but um, anyway, there's no doubt uh, that the kind of corruption that developed after independence is, is on a different level. Um, and corruption, which is often then defined as the abuse of, of power for, for private gain, uh, it includes a quite wide spectrum of, of activities. You can think of it from, from these small sums of money that um, civil servants demand in return for legalizing various documents uh, on this lower level to these huge amounts that are turned over in relation to, for example, procurement of mining contracts or, or um, yeah, infrastructure projects. And normally these, these aspects are seen as two separate things. You have on the one hand then this petty or administrative corruption and on the other uh, grand or elite corruption. So the first is often seen as driven by survival and the second uh, by greed. Yeah, uh, But um, I would say that yeah. I, b I believe it's, it's a mistake to, to see these levels as unrelated in, in Central Asia, where corruption is organized as a, very much as a pyramid. So, so you can say that corruption serves as a way of organizing the state, uh, including you know, determining access to, to political and economic power, and also to the bureaucracy. So in this sense, also corruption becomes uh, a de facto institutionalized part of, of the political order. So those at the bottom of this hierarchy, they are locked into a system that requires them to, to pay off their superiors, you can say. And I also think that a parallel to a kind of corporation, which concludes a franchise agreement, is a rather good illustration here. Um, holding certain lucrative jobs here in the state, sometimes in, in Russian called Tioplium uh, Mesta, in, in the state here, um, allows a person basically to claim the authority, the main mandate, resources, and, and brand name of the state to, to collect rents 
from, from this position. So I would say that the system has its distinct logic and it affects most, if not all, of the elementary spheres of, of governance. Uh, for example, example, you see that uh, economic development is often circumscribed, uh, circumscribed by, by a huge shadow economy and widespread tax evasion. Uh, another example is, of course, that welfare or public goods and services, in practice, uh, they become um, privatized. So when the state provides this as, uh, at quite a low level, it also opens up for especially I would say at the local level for various strongmen to, to step in as uh, alternative suppliers. And uh, interesting thing is that these suppliers, they are often connected to the state, I would say, uh, but they tend to supply these goods and services to selected people in, in their own names. Uh, here you may think of this wealthy infamous customs boss Matraimov in, in Kyrgyzstan who has basically lived off the state his entire career, but has strong local supporters because he uses some of these corrupt earnings here yeah, uh, on the people. So he builds his own brand here and, and uh, in the process he also undermines the, the legitimacy of the very state that he, uh, he has belonged to. Um, I had intended to, to say some things also about anti-corruption since um, I see that time is running out, let me just mention one aspect. And uh, that is, I mean, traditionally academics and, and policymakers, they have typically seen corruption as a national or law enforcement issue, often in, in developing countries, it, it's a focus on, yeah. However, I would say that now it's clear that in order to combat corruption, these transnational links uh, must be targeted also or included. Um, and when it comes to Central Asia, here you can see that uh, Cooley and, and Heather Shaw, they have been the pioneers, I would say, regarding Central Asia. Uh, they have examined how, how Central Asian political and economic elites, uh, how they use uh, global financial institutions and, and these offshore tax havens to hide their wealth. Yeah. But, but also uh, in recent times, you know, journalistic investigations have, uh, I would say, even taken this even further with very detailed investigations uh, which shows that corruption in Central Asia, it's not really an isolated national or even regional problem, but it's interlinked and very much enabled by, by the international financial system. And then also it's major uh, hubs, you can say, in, in the West. Uh, so I think this aspect um, is something that needs to be brought in if we, we want to really address uh, the problem. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Engel. Really, uh, really interesting. And again, I really enjoyed reading Engel's, um, Johan's, sorry, Johan's uh, book. Uh, sorry, I'm sorry. I'm a little bit jet like from uh, coming back to I really enjoyed uh, reading uh, Johan's um, chapter on, on corruption. Um, he, he does a really good job uh, putting together his uh, in-depth research of corruption into a very concise product. So thank you, uh, Johan. Now we move on to issues of religion and we have Galim and uh, Ed uh, discuss uh, religion. Let's start uh, with uh, Galim. Galim, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, um, uh, Rico, uh, Erika, thank you very much for inviting me to join uh, this, um, in my view, fantastic. Personally, I learned a lot. And uh, um, uh, previously, I thought that I could write my chapter in, uh, in due time, but uh, it became a very difficult task for me because uh, uh, as I've said, I learned a lot from my project and uh, uh, thank you for inviting me and thank you for suggesting this topic. Um, it's about Islam and liberalism. For many people, these two concepts uh, seem, uh, if, not counter, uh, if not oxymoronic, but at least contradictory. Uh, for example, this, the situation in Afghanistan, the rise of Taliban, uh, the rise of uh, political Islam around the world, even uh, in Turkey, in Turkish Republic, uh, the situation in uh, in last years became very, very, uh, very, very problematic. 
and uh, to talk about any compatibility between Islam and liberalism, even uh, uh, even any kind of uh, small talk became uh, became very difficult. Uh, but uh, during uh, my research, I personally learned a lot. Uh, first, uh, uh, I want to highlight some points concerning my position. Uh, I took uh, Islam as a social phenomenon. Uh, like any religion, Islam is a social phenomenon. It's not um, a collection of books descended, descended from heaven in one night. <laughs> it's a product of people's mind, people's reason. Uh, who produced uh, this body of uh, knowledge or body of uh, information for decades, for centuries. And second, uh, I accepted liberalism as something uh, more complex. It's not only a neoliberal, uh, it's not only neoliberalism. Uh, personally, uh, yeah, I, I, I came from a neo-Marxist tradition. I studied Gramsci, neo-Gramsci uh, approach, and because of this, I cannot be sympathetic to neoliberalism. <laughs> uh, it's uh, just to clarify my position. Uh, third, um, uh, during my research, I found I found out uh, very good works uh, produced by Yale professor and Andrew March and uh, Turkish Czechian scholar Gurham Bajik, and they uh, emphasized uh, so-called rationalistic approach in religion, particularly rationalistic approach in Islam. And uh, for my great surprise, um, Islam in Central Asia, so-called traditional Islam, uh, maturidism or maturity Islam, had been, had been rationalistic. But now, in our days, it's a dogmatic Islam, it's a demodern Islam, and uh, only the name maturidism left. And uh, no any rationalistic epistemology uh, is present in our days. And in my chapter, I wanted to uh, focus on several paradoxes. And one of them is this one, uh, second paradox. Historically, in Central Asia, rationalistic Islam was present, but now we have uh, we have only the name maturidism, but um, no any uh, any rationalism left in the mind of Muslim leaders, uh, Islamic uh, opinion leaders. Uh, it's a very interesting paradox. Second paradox, which I wanted to analyze, it's a uh, attitude of uh, Central Asian people. Um, according to my research, according to research of, of my colleagues, uh, a great majority of people in Central Asia want almost the same things which people in the Western countries want. Like they, they want the things like uh, the accountable government, the protection of their rights, uh, social services, the rule of law, and they are liberal values. And it's an interesting paradox. People, people live in Central Asia, they want almost the same values like the people in the Western countries, but they, allegedly against liberalism because of uh, information war, information war between, okay, we, we all know, uh, between Russia and the rest, and because of many stereotypes spread in social media, uh, in, uh, in the publications of some local scholars. Um, and also I wanted to focus on the views of younger generations, uh, because uh, being based in Almaty, I can interact with young people, young Kazakhstanis, and uh, excuse me, it's a timer. And uh, according to my knowledge, younger generation wants younger people want uh, more different understanding of religion. They they want more gender egalitarian, particularly younger generation of females in Central Asia. And uh, in my chapter, I, 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 I wanted to highlight these uh, points, rationalistic Islam, that in Central Asia, historically, rationalistic Islam was dominant, but it became now just the name. Even uh, the representatives of religious bureau bureaucracy don't know about the basic epistemological qualities of maturidism, but, it's, but it has a great potential, I think, to build synergy between uh, religious and liberal uh, principles, values, and the uh, position of youth uh, were also very important in my analysis. 
And of course, the different understandings of liberalism, because liberalism cannot be equalized to neoliberalism, because neoliberalism, in my view, uh, undermined liberal ideal, undermined liberal values. And thank you for inviting me. And I learned a lot. I uh, it was a great opportunity to upgrade my knowledge to learn more. Uh, thank you for for this uh, project. Thank you, Gollum. Yes, uh, it's again another fascinating chapter uh, to read from an unexpected, unconventional um, uh, perspective. Is uh, Gollum's chapter on liberalism and Islam in Central Asia. So uh, we see some questions coming in. Please uh, keep on sending them. Uh, we're going to open up to Q and A um, very soon. And now moving on to Ed's chapter on um, the state responses to Islam. Ed, the floor is yours. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, Rika, for inviting me today. I like to echo what everyone else has said about the importance of this volume. I don't know about others, but when I've been designing my syllabi for, for teaching courses that contain content on Central Asia, it's sometimes been difficult to find introductory texts. And I think this volume is fantastic. And in fact, I've already ordered it for my library and I'm using it in my teaching um, this semester. I've incorporated it into my, into my syllabus. So I think this, you know, a number of the chapters here for really all the chapters on their different topics offer great um, overviews of the literature and, um, and really are a great resource for, for those of us wanting to understand the region more, wanting to keep up with contemporary scholarship, but also for students, um, in, for those of us who are teaching. Um, content on the region. My chapter is on the securitization of religion. Of course, Islam is the large focus of, of, of the chapter, but you know, I also mentioned the way in which um, certain Christian minorities, um, Jehovah's Witnesses, Baptists, Mormons, and others have fallen within this category within state thinking of bad Islam. And so I look at securitization, which is the process by which um, certain threats groups become framed as a security, security threat. So it's the process by which through discourses and practices, um, Islam and certain forms of religion have been labeled by the different states in Central Asia as a threat to national security. So I draw on this division, which is something of a simplification between, on the one hand, good state-sponsored Islam that's incorporated, as Dina said, into um, discourses of nation building. Um, and is an integral part of, of national identity, um, but it's safe for so long as it's under the control and uh, watch of the state on the one hand, and then the forms of Islam that are securitized, that are viewed as bad, extremist, and outside of government control. I look at the ways in which um, there are some carryovers in terms of policy making and some similarities in the way religion is framed as certain forms of religion are framed as, as being backwards, as being dangerous, as being proceeding from outside of the region, um, from places like the Middle East. Um, and these are contrasted with safe local forms of religious expression. So again, that's an oversimplification. And obviously I think the great challenge of, of writing these chapters, I guess, as others found is taking a very complex topic, trying to look at five countries, which I think is a, is a very good approach from the comparative perspective, but also trying to, to, to reflect these nuances and these, these complexities is obviously a great challenge. And I think, you know, it's very, very difficult to, uh, to do and probably I failed in, in doing so. But um, I then adopt a, a what is a Foucauldian typology of the practices of managing religion in the region, which range from um, I range from uh, what is called um, sovereign power, which is the way in which um, the state on extreme end arrests, closes down mosques, um, and restricts religion with very repressive, openly overtly repressive practices. Then I look at disciplinary power, the way in which they try and shape um, the what, what, what we can know about religion, shape religious education, and these sort of these sort of ways in which they try and discipline subjects to be loyal to the state. And then finally, moving towards biopower, I look at the way they try and um, construct through education and other practices um, loyal subjects that are ultimately um, like take take the same view of religion that they do. Um, and are loyal to the state, patriotic, and ultimately do not form a threat to the authoritarian governments of the region. 
I think my chapter is well paired with, with Galim's, um, with Bayram Balchis as well on Islamic revival, and also with David Lewis's chapter on authoritarianism in the future, because very much my argument is that counter extremism, for example, is less about fighting a security threat, although that of course exists, it's being used by the governments of the region um, to crack down on all forms of potential opposition to the state. Just to briefly finish, because I know we're out of time, I'll get to Q&A, um, just wanted to touch on three potential avenues for research that have been started, but I think um, can be developed further. I think the first is looking at how sustainable these forms of, of assertive secularism are, so far as the state is placed above religion, the state can regulate religion, but religion can, from, from the bottom up, from the societal perspective, can't play a particularly prominent role in, in influencing state policies in many cases. When we have the development of new technologies and ways of spreading knowledge about religion, when we have um, increasing societal interest in um, very diverse forms of religion, from the more liberal interpretation that Galim was mentioning through to more conservative interpretations, wanting Islam to play a more prominent role in public life. How sustainable is this current model of governance? I think linked to this on the, the point around legacies, and this of course builds, feeds into a broader debate around post-colonialism in the region and to what extent, you know, is the region still, has it ever been post-Soviet? Um, to what extent now we're seeing personnel changes within the government and a new generation of individuals who've grown up since the, since independence 30 years ago to what extent are their worldviews different to what extent are, to what extent will some of these legacies continue to be passed down in terms of understandings of religion as i said and to what extent will new cadres continue to emerge that are gonna going to play a role in maybe reshaping state religious relations and i think finally um building off broader debates on uh, decolonizing Central Asian studies, which I think are picked up um, in this book and also been picked up by a number of other, particularly scholars from the region, which I think is very important. You know, my chapter is very much, much of the writing on freedom of religion in the region is, comes from the liberal perspective. Um, but I think, you know, there are those who are working within a different epistemology, ontology, maybe cosmology, such as Emil Nasreddinov, who are critiquing and approaching this question from a very different perspective, um, in some cases from, obviously from an Islamic perspective. And I think this sort of scholarship um, is very valid in particular because for many people in Central Asia itself, this is, this is, this is the worldview that they have. And so um, but engaging with that and those approaches and those understandings of the problem um, will be particularly important, I think, as we as this field continues to develop. But with that, I will conclude and hand over to the moderators. Thanks, uh, Ed. That was great. Thanks very much. So just to remind everyone that we're very happy to receive uh, questions. There's some that have already come in, um, which I'll go through now. But if you've got questions, please do write them in the chat. Uh, if you've got questions specific to contributors or about the volume in general, um, we're very happy to answer them. So um, the first one that I have actually is from Mindy uh, Reiser and it's for Johan. So the question is, what developments do you see in the Central Asian countries of the role of NGOs in combating corruption? Are students involved in such efforts? So if I just open that first question up to Johan. Thank you. Yeah, great question. Uh, maybe I would say when I really did my, my field research on, on this topic, it's basically almost a decade ago now. But what I see the difference, two aspects that I, I, I would highlight them from a more broader uh, societal or anti-corruption perspective, especially with a the focus then on Kyrgyzstan. Uh, it's one thing is uh, the aspect of journalism, I would say. Um, uh, where you can see there's a much more reporting uh, and very solid reporting out there from the region, from local um, journalists, especially in Kyrgyzstan, uh, which have really uh, uh, shown 
in, in detail uh, th this um, phenomenon uh, to, to a much and given us much better understanding of the different links and, and the nature of it than, than when I tried to do this um, earlier. But I would say that the paradox in a way can be that since there is so much reporting out there also um, and it's a solid reporting, um, the idea, it can almost be that people, when they hear m a lot about this, then the, the paradox is that they, they believe that things are only getting worse and worse and worse. Yeah, uh, although that might not might might not necessarily be be the case. Yeah, uh, if you compare, for instance, uh, Kyrgyzstan on the Bakiev uh, and post 2010. Yeah, I don't think. Uh, the situation has become any worse yeah, if you look at the Baki, but then things and the, especially the media sphere was much tighter uh, controlled, yeah, so there was much less information out there. Uh, the second aspect I, I would mention uh, is this grassroots movements that uh, and this protest against corruption, which has come up the last couple of years, you can really say. Um, and um, in Kyrgyzstan in particular, you can see this quite uh, innovative initiatives uh, from the grass, grassroots level, uh, which, which really has taken this to a to, to new level, I would say, which is um, also have had um, was one factor in, in, in the events that eventually led to, to the latest revolt there in a year ago. Thank you. Great, thank you, Johan. Um, so actually the, the, the second question in the chat is also for Johan, but it cites Dina. So I wonder if Dina might also want to come in uh, after Johan gives a response. So um, in her book, Dina Shodopova outlines corruption in the medical context in Kazakhstan through examples of informal payments to medical staff. Elsewhere, there is discussion of informal payments for better medical care as an assistance instance of care. In other words, acts and practices of caring for sick kin. I was wondering uh, if Johan Engvall thought about corruption from an individual perspective as a project of individual ethics. Sorry, I forgot that's from Gazelle Kamalova. Thank you. Um, so, for, yeah, if Johan, and I don't know if Dina also wants to contribute as well. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, maybe I give my take on this. I hope I understood it correctly here. This individual or ethical aspect about this, uh, I would say that. Uh, the thing for, from from my perspective it's the systemic thing with with corruption here so it's not about people or individuals uh, as much as it's more that they are trapped or they are part of this system yeah uh, so if you want to to have medical treatment or good education a bribe might be needed yeah and all uh, so, so in, in that sense, you know, when, when that is uh, what, what's needed, then it's not strange that, that people pay, um, I would say. So, so, and also this is, a, I would say, corruption is like most social practices here. Yeah, this is a very much a reciprocal uh, phenomenon, I would say. Um, the more people believe that, that uh, or expect others to be corrupt, the, the more likely it is that they, they will also uh, take part in this uh, themselves yeah because it's um, it's hardly beneficial to, to to stand outside of of this system yeah for instance uh, yeah if, so if, if you know that all your colleagues or you believe that you know that all of them are taking bribes or participating in this then from a uh, for, for your own perspective yeah then it makes no sense whatsoever to 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 stay out of outside of this the only thing that happens is that uh, you and your family will become worse off compared to, to all your colleagues who, who take part in this. Um, so, and I, I sometimes use this uh, example that I had from a couple of persons in, in Kyrgyzstan when they said that, um, Johan, you have to understand that um, corruption in Kyrgyzstan is like uh, the Olympic Games. Most important is not to, to, to win, but to take part. So it's, it's this kind of logic, I would say. Thanks. Dina, did you want to comment as well on this? Well, <laughs> I just want to say that um, this book has been written already a long time ago, but uh, when I talk to my students and uh, we discuss the issue of corruption, uh, so everyone recognizes that it's ethically bad, right? It's uh, from the individual perspective, ethically is bad, but on the other hand, um, 
many also admit that it is kind of a norm. So like kind of at the abstract level, it's bad, but when it comes to you, to an individual, then uh, if you want to get some things done, so people just do that, you know, and don't, they don't think uh, that it's uh, uh, illegal or it's bad. So to some extent, it's kind of normalization uh, or internalization of uh, corruption at the individual level in Kazakhstan. And also it's an interesting point uh, that uh, Johan made about this, you know, different per perceptions. I don't know, I think that the uh, probably rating uh, of trans Transparency International for Kazakhstan has been improving and, uh, you know, there is some kind of, you know, um, better, better rating uh, for our country is going on. But what, uh, again, I see um, in, in the mass media, you always read uh, that uh, there are lots of, you know, corruption cases, lots of uh, um, officials have been accused of corruption and jailed. So there is also a perception that uh, there is no improvement, that it's kind of a permanent uh, kind of condition for, for us so far. Thanks, Dina. So um, the next question we have is from Ifta Kahrul. Uh, I guess I'm going to open this up probably to Ed and Galim, if that's OK. It strikes me that this might be a question that you both have uh, some thoughts on. So can any of the, but it's open to all, can any of the authors talk about the current state of Islamist extremism in Central Asia? Discuss. I, I can go first, or Galim, I don't, I don't mind. Um, well, I think um, I would rather talk about terrorism because I think that's a little easier to nail down. And I think Islamic extremism is a little more amorphous and the way in which the governments of the region have framed extremism is very broad and all sorts of different groups have been labeled, labeled extremism. In terms of the terrorist threat, what we saw, you know, um, in the five, six years ago with the, the war in Syria and Iraq was around five to 8,000 Central Asian citizens moving to that theater, joining terrorist groups there. What we saw was the threat of terrorism from Central Asia really manifesting itself outside the region, right? in places like Stockholm, in New York, in Istanbul. Um, and we haven't really seen a very prominent terrorist threat within the region. Some of the research I've done have pointed to there being 19 attacks since 2008. That's even if we adopt a very broad definition of terrorism um, that takes the government at its word if it labels an act a terrorist act. Um, of these, most of them have targeted the state, most of them targeted, um, targeted um, uh, law enforcement agencies in particular. We've seen very few um, acts of what could be called international terrorism. One of the only such attacks was in 2018 in the summer when four cyclists, tourists were killed in uh, Tajikistan, and that was viably claimed by Islamic State. We've seen many predictions of Central Asia becoming a hotbed of, of terrorism, and they've never materialized. We saw the prediction that, for example, there would be returning foreign fighters from Syria and Iraq as the caliphate lost its territory. Um, that never really materialized in any meaningful way. We've seen predictions that when borders closed during COVID-19, migrants wouldn't be able to migrate, which was certainly the case, particularly in Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan. But we didn't see that resulting in any spike in, in the terrorist threat. Now we're seeing predictions that Afghanistan and, and the ongoing situation will, will shape the, the terrorist threat within the region. And of course, it's too early to say that. I think what we can say is that the threat has never been uh, materialized itself in, in very prominent ways. And that in fact, counter extremism on the part of the state has affected many more thousands of people than those who've been affected by terrorism. That's where I'll finish. Thanks, Ed. Uh, Galeen. Okay. Uh, just a few words. Yes, uh, I agree with, with Ed. Uh, it's very difficult to define extremism uh, because in Central Asian countries, it, 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 it's a very vague concept. And um, who is an extremist? In one country, extremist organization may be legally function in, uh, in another country. And uh, in my view, we should look more at social problems because, uh, for example, in Kazakhstan, uh, uh, in my view, a uh, significant part of, uh, of the people who became uh, the members of uh, extremist or radical groups uh, did this because of social despair. 
it's my uh, my own observation and second i think we should look um it's uh, it's a connection between uh, exclusive radical religious ideas and criminal culture because segments of central asian society this uh, penetration of radical and criminal ideas or criminal and radical ideas um, it, uh, okay uh, it's just uh, i i think uh, ed um, uh, answered um, this question okay thank you thank you gilly uh, so just going down, we only have a few minutes left, but so there's another question for, for Johan, uh, which I think is uh, from uh, Kirad, which I, I believe is is trying to get on, um, I suppose, the extent to which your, your research has touched upon how sort of the international community in the region, such as banks, diplomatic missions, uh, commercial organizations and NGOs have been reacting, working, avoiding uh, against or with um, corruption in relation to their work? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the, I mean, anti-corruption has become such a huge industry, you can really say over the past 15, maybe 20 years almost now. So, so it's, it's a big, big aspect here, but I would say I mean, this connection between uh, governments and the international aid and, and uh, this type of, of things, uh, I would say that in general, the anti-corruption programs have been, they try to depoliticize it, I would say, in a way, with this type of technocratic or technical projects, which ultimately um, are quite um, insufficient since politics really matter here and, and that aspect is quite you know um, difficult to, to 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 address here for, for many international organizations so then they continue working on this and and the out outcome is about the same but you can really see I would say that um, um, I mean on the ground uh, in Central Asia these anti-corruption programs have, have for a long time now been part of this national international efforts to 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 address uh, this problem but but nothing really changes here and i would say that my own understanding in a way is that i was considerably more optimistic earlier in in a way um, about this type of direct anti-corruption programs here so i was also thinking quite a lot about it how to you know, maybe I should I should try to find some kind of manual how to to address this about strategy and tactics or where to start and how to to build some kind of coherent program of this. Uh, yeah, you hear yourself; it's totally unrealistic, I would say. So my my idea is more today. I think that we need to to and if you look at Kyrgyzstan at the moment yeah this uh, arrests all the time day after day this cannot be a sustainable uh, type of uh, you know situation so i think this be trying to punitive approach and all that is uh, uh, completely useless and i think that you have to it's better to try to address this in a much more indirect way and that then it needs more broader type of reforms that that um, and then maybe corruption the room for it will will disappear over time i think that's more promising actually nowadays than, than this type of focused campaigns thank you thanks johan um we're pretty much out of time but there's a, a quite a few questions coming in so i think maybe we could just have one more question uh, and then we'll wrap up. But this question is from Driss, and <laughs> it's uh, it's quite something of a question in one sense. Uh, it's whether, I mean, could any of us, anyone on the panel, I mean, maybe I'll, I'll give everyone like a chance to give sort of one, two sentence response. I don't know. Um, could any of us sort of give a definitive idea of the extent of improvement of democracy in relation to Western and worldwide standards in Central Asia? So I guess that question is really, democracy central asia question mark um does anyone want to have a go at that dina do you have anything 
to say. I think it relates really uh, to your chapter. Yeah. So is it about uh, the movement toward democracy, right, uh, in Central Asia? Um, well, <laughs> Uh, there was always a hope that Central Asian states will move toward uh, more democracy. And actually what uh, we see is that there is some variation in terms of uh, maybe not democracy, but like um, authoritarianism, right? We see maybe less of that in uh, Kyrgyzstan and more in Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. And uh, they will hope, uh, for instance, in Kazakhstan when um, Tokayev uh, changed uh, Nazarbayev, um, uh, in uh, 2019, and uh, again, lots of hopes that uh, there will be some changes. Uh, but what we see is some kind of formal or tokenistic uh, changes because uh, uh, even if uh, under Turkey certain laws have been adopted uh, in terms of uh, more participation of political parties, but we don't see the real opposition in the parliament of Kazakhstan. Uh, we also don't see uh, the, um, you know, more participation of the uh, NGOs in the decision-making process, despite, uh, again, new decrees and laws. Uh, I mean, all these kind of changes are um, cosmetic changes and uh, have a little bit, um, you know, uh, tokenistic nature. So um, it's probably difficult to say about the prospects of democracy in the region. Uh, but maybe um, if more civil society organization would be involved in the decision-making process and the authoritarian, uh, the rulers will be more uh, receptive of that. Maybe th there might be some changes in the future. Um, but so far, um, you know, even the change, uh, the um, change of the leader in Kyrgyzstan, we observe that uh, there is uh, focus more on the expansion of the powers of the executive rather than, uh, you know, giving more powers to the people. Thank you, Gina. <laughs> Thank you, Gina. I think you, you did great. Probably I'm not very optimistic about that, but uh, <laughs> that's what I see today. Yeah, I th uh, thanks very much, Dina. That was a, a, a great uh, answer to the question so i think we'll we'll wrap up but just before we we do I, I wanted to finish with a couple of things firstly um there has been of course some questions which haven't been unanswered un sorry have, have not been been answered but uh, ed actually has very kindly been putting some links in the chat to follow which addresses some of those questions um of course if you do have questions that we haven't been able to discuss today feel free to contact the the contributors and myself or erica um what I just wanted to say about the book before we before we finish is that many of you will have noticed that unfortunately the the hardback copy is is unfortunately very expensive. Um, the Kindle electronic version is much more affordable, and we also have a discount code. Erica has put details of that in the chat. Um, so there is a twenty percent discount code that you can use uh, on the book. Um, my hope is that soon enough it will come out in paper book. If you work for a university, of course, you can ask your um, institution to your library institution to purchase it. And hopefully you'll be able to use it in teaching. That was, I think, as we discussed, one of the, um, the aims of the volume. Um, yeah, and I, but I think on, on that note, that's uh, all, all I want to say. Um, Ed also, because um, a lot of our discussion has been about corruption, Ed has also posted a link, a useful link to what's going to be, I'm sure, an absolutely amazing discussion next Monday. Um, I can't find the details of it now in the chat, but maybe maybe Ed will just repost that before we finish. Uh, but that's next Monday, I believe, uh, on corruption in Kyrgyzstan, specifically in relation to um, the recent uh, revolution. So just to finish by saying, well, first of all, thank you for everyone for joining us. Thanks for GWU and the Central Asia Program for hosting this book launch. Um, and thank you in particular for the contributors for their, for their ex excellent um, presentations and, and the discussion. And um, we hope that you find the book useful and, uh, and are able to use it in some way. But um, Erica, did you want to 
Anything? Yes, I just want to thank uh, our contributors, um, uh, Dina Galem, Johan, Ed. Uh, thank you so much for your fantastic work and for uh, joining us today. Uh, you all work on this challenging COVID environment, but uh, your chapters are incredible. Um, this is the conversation we had based on four chapters, but there are so many. Um, there are 26 more chapters in the book that we uh, can generate uh, all types of interesting conversations. So uh, we're really proud of this volume of how, how it came out to be. So uh, hopefully it will be a useful resource uh, for a wide range of readers. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, GW. Thanks.